I can defend or criticize the role of the government at home during the war. We're not talking about foreign policy and getting us into war with Germany. We're talking about the policy and plans and actions of the government during the war inside the United States. I can defend or criticize the legislative branch's disapproval of the Treaty of Versailles. So understand why did they disapprove of that? During the war, the government often suspends a lot of our rights in order to win the war, and they take care of the economy. They take control of the economy, I should say. What do you mean by take control of the economy? Well, they will tell businesses. Now, they don't completely take over businesses. Sometimes they kind of do. But often they will strongly encourage businesses to, hey, you need to stop making automobiles. We need to stop making goods for consumers. And we need you to turn your factory into a war machine. And we need you to build guns, bombs, missiles, tanks, clothing for the military. Whatever you're doing, we're going to need you to change some of your production over to help out with the war efforts. And... It's not complete totalitarian government here, and sometimes it is, where the government basically just does it. But a lot of times, it's, during World War I, the businesses and the government work together hand in hand. Also, the government will create a, a new department in the executive branch called the Committee of Public Information. It's pretty much just the Committee of Propaganda, what is propaganda, where the government exaggerates facts, exaggerates truth, often lies, misleads people, mischaracterizes what's really going on in order to serve the common good, which is go win the war. So they will make Germany look like evil monsters make them look subhuman. They will do whatever they want, whatever they need to do to convince the public, encourage the public, trick the public into doing what it wants. We still do pub propaganda today, but it's much more propaganda light. It's fact-based. It's not really an exaggeration, but there is still this, um, not the Committee of Public Information, but the government still works to convince people to do things to help out the government. The Committee of Public Information will also create war bonds. What are war bonds? You can loan your money to the government. Why would I want to loan my money to the government? Well, they're going to give you an IOU in return. And it comes with interest. So let's say you loan them $100. You earn interest on that. And that means in the end, you will get $105. So not only are you helping out your country and government by loaning them money, but also you are earning interest in return and making money off them for all intents and purposes. You are a bank. You feel good about what you're doing and you're making that cash. Also, the, and, and they're going to use that money to buy military supplies and hopefully help them win the war. The Committee of Public Information takes control of the economy. They create war bonds during World War I. And they also will create victory gardens. So right before we talk about Victory Gardens, they'll also encourage you to starve yourself to death. The Committee of Public Information will tell you, hey, starve yourself, fatty. <laughs> no, they don't do that. But they encourage you to eat less and ration. Why? Because if you eat less, that means there may be more food for the soldiers. And if the soldiers are healthy and eating, then maybe they can win quicker and we get this war over with. So you're doing another thing. Whether you are giving money to the government, here's another way that you can help out. Another way you can help out is planting a garden in your background. Why? Background backyard. Why would I do this? Well, if you get all of your food from the supermarket, then some of that food can't go to the soldiers. So what we could do is only buy some of your food from the supermarket. The rest can then go to the soldiers. Well, how do you make up for the difference? I used to get more food. Now I don't. You will have to grow the rest of your food on your own. So if you just eat the food that you grow, then the majority of the food grown in the United States can go to our soldiers, keep them healthy, and we can win the war. The Committee of Public Information does not make you do this. We are not an autocratic regime. It's not a totalitarian government. They strongly encourage you to do it. Wink, wink, nod, nod. You can see some examples and here you notice, well, this is actually from World War II. Yeah, it's actually from World War II. We will do it again. The Espionage Act, on its face, doesn't seem like a bad idea. We should have a law that prevents people from spying on the country. And if you're spying, yeah, you're going to hurt the war effort. We can't have that happening, so we're going to throw you in jail. But that's not where it stops. It goes a little bit far further. It makes it illegal to cause or attempt to cause insubordination, disloyalty, mutiny, refusal of duty in the military or naval forces of the United States, or to willfully obstruct the recruiting uh, or the enlistment service of the United States. So this guy, Shank, is passing out basically anti-war pamphlets. Really what they say are pamphlets or pieces of paper encouraging people not to join the war. Encouraging people not to, if they got drafted, don't go to the war. Don't fight this war. It's a bad war. We're serving the corporatists. We're serving the elites. We're helping out the rich. We're helping out the imperialists. We should have no business in this war. And as he passes out those flyers, he's arrested and thrown in jail. You're probably screaming to yourself, you can't do that. Yes, they can. The Espionage Act. Remember when we said it went too far? It says if you're willfully, if you willfully obstruct the recruiting or enlistment 
service of the United States. He's getting in the way of people joining the military. And the Espionage Act says that's illegal. And you're screaming, freedom of speech, freedom of speech. First Amendment of the Constitution says you can say whatever you want. You have the freedom to say. And if he wants to speak bad about the war, if he wants to tell people that you shouldn't join the war, he should be protected. Well, the Espionage Act says no, you can't. The Espionage Act is a law that says you cannot obstruct the recruiting or enlistment service of the United States. So, it goes to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court has to look at the law and they have to look at the Constitution to decide, okay, what are we going to do? Does this violate the First Amendment of the Constitution? If so, then we have to throw out the Espionage Act and tear it out because nothing can violate the laws written in the First Amendment or any part of the Constitution. And most people clearly say, look, this is great and all, but this is violating freedom of speech. What the Supreme Court will say, as this ruling, Schenck for the United States, Schenck versus the United States, freedom of speech is not absolute. Your freedoms in the Bill of Rights and other rights that exist are not absolute. They have limits. There are limits to every single freedom. You can't go into a movie theater, and this is what Oliver Wendell Holmes, the Supreme Court Justice here, will say. You can't go into a movie theater that's crammed full of people and scream fire because then people are going to rush out. People are going to get injured. Your speech cannot hurt people. That's where we draw the line. You have freedom of speech, but it's not absolute. There are limits. Where do we draw that line? Where is the limit? He says the limit comes when you endanger people, like going into a movie theater and screaming fire. Someone can get hurt. Your free, your, your speech is no longer protected at that point. The words used create a clear and present danger that they will bring about the substantive evils that the Congress has a right to prevent. So he is saying the government has the right to pass the Espionage Act. The government has the right to pass laws that limit speech if that speech creates a clear and present danger. If that speech can harm someone, then the government can create laws that limit that speech. This law limits that speech because they argue that what he is doing creates a clear and present danger. You're saying, well, what clear and present danger did he create? By passing out the anti-war pamphlets, encouraging people not to join the military, he is hurting the war effort. That's creating a clear and present danger. If we can't win the war, it puts our soldiers and our country in danger. And so they will argue that his actions did create a danger. They did create a substantive evil Thus, his speech is not protected and he goes to jail. We still have this today. This is a uh, uh, the stare decisis. This will often be cited when we look at what speech is tolerated and what speech is not tolerated. Your freedom of speech is not absolute. There are limits, again, if you put people in danger, if you harm people with your speech, that's where the line is crossed. So sometimes we get an argument, well, did you harm them or not? That's another case for another day. But this precedent has been settled. Your speech is not absolute. Also, the other big takeaway from Schenck, United States, this is still on the books. The Espionage Act is still on the books. And so if your speech creates a clear and present danger or substantive evil, the government can limit it. The government can also continue to pass laws that limit it going into the future. They can pass new laws that limit speech as long as the arguments made that, oh, that will, we are limiting that speech because it's creating a clear and present danger. Let's look at this man from South Dakota. He says, this man, this is during World War I, if I were conscription age and had no dependents and were drafted, now these are ifs because he's too old. He has not been conscripted. He has not been drafted. They are not making him. He's just saying, if this happened, I would refuse to serve. They could shoot me, but they could not make me fight. He's just saying, if. Okay, this is not a situation that's happening. You're probably, if you're thinking like, oh, he was drafted and he doesn't want to go, that you can't do that. Part of your civic duties is that you have to go if served, if called. He's not being called. He's too old. He's saying, if they made me, I wouldn't go. So it's just, a, he's just talking trash. And they threw him in jail. They threw him in jail for talking trash. He's not refusing to serve. He's just speaking about how he hates the war. And why do they throw him in jail? Because basically the Espionage Act says the students, citizens cannot do anything that hurts the ability to win the war. That's a substantive evil. That's creating a clear and present danger. Your speech, according to the government, is creating a substantive evil. It's creating a clear and present danger. This old man talking trash and disparaging our country, that's too far. We can't have it. And if this guy in South Dakota talks a bunch of trash, we might lose the war. Seems like an exaggeration, but he spent a year in jail for saying that.
because of the Espionage Act. Like, but you got freedom of speech. We already said the Supreme Court in Shank versus the United States rules that these are not absolute. Can't scream fire. Clear and present danger. Substantive evil. Too bad, so sad. Oh, man. So you're probably thinking, man, I need to start choosing my words wisely. I'm thinking that myself as I record these videos. Emma Goldman will go a step further. She's not just passing out pamphlets. She creates a group, an organization called the No, no Conscription League. Basically, an anti-draft, don't join the Army League. Well, they pull the Espionage Act out of her, throw her in jail for two years, and then they go a step further. They kick her out of the country. She's an anarchist. They say, oh, you want to be an anarchist, huh? Well, guess what? Why don't you go over to Russia? There's plenty of anarchy over there. And like, why did you pick a pirate ship? Because being an anarchist and looking at her history, that's the most fitting boat to put her on. They didn't literally put her on a, a pirate ship, but it's close enough, right? This is the government. You're thinking, we started with victory gardens and war bonds and, hey, you know, don't make cars. We're going to need you just to uh, make some military tanks. No big deal. When the war's over, we'll go back, right? Now it's, oh, did you say something bad about the government? You're going to jail. Or someone down the street heard you say something bad about the government and they snitch on you, you go to jail. That's what was happening. Thousands of people were arrested and thrown in jail because of the Espionage Act. Many of them Germans because eh, he's talking German. He must be a spy or maybe he's saying bad stuff. Throw him in jail. There's a good point. We do need to stop spies, but where do we draw the line? And we still have this today. We've got Bradley Manning and Edward Snowden who, I mean, they illegally released information, but they were telling the public about the illegal things the government was doing. But by, re by releasing this information, which was talking about the bad things the government was doing, they were creating a clear and present danger. So they are, even though, and, and so I, I probably should let you know that Bradley Manning is Chelsea Manning now. And I want to make sure I clear that up because I guess technically I just dead named her and I don't want to get this video pulled from YouTube. So Chelsea Manning and Edward Snowden are, well, he, she has been um, released and forgiven for her crimes. He is still the most wanted man and he's forced to live over in Russia. Also with the Espionage Act was this little tiny addendum called the Sedition Act. Now, if you go back to 1798, we had the Alien and Sedition Act, which was borderline illegal then. And, and so guess what? We brought it back. We got this law that was so terrible. Hey, let's bring it back. And it said it took, took the uh, Espionage Act and made it even crazier. It's a crime to willfully utter, print, write, or publish any disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the form of the government of the United States. So basically, every one of these YouTube videos would land me in prison if it were 1918. Willfully urge, incite, or advocate any curtailment of the production of the thing. So I haven't done that. Well, I mean, I guess I've, I don't know. But I definitely have done that, which would be against the Sedition Act. Thankfully, the Sedition Act went too far and the government realized, all right, maybe we're going a little too far. So they repealed the Sedition Act and we have restored freedom of speech. But under the Sedition Act, you couldn't protest. You couldn't speak out. You would be in prison. But the Espionage Act is still on the books today, and the Espionage Act has plenty enough. I mean, someone could argue that all oh, your YouTube videos are preventing the government during a time of terror, because there is a war of terror. Your videos are creating a clear and present danger and creating a substantive evil that are making it more difficult for the government to fight its wars. You could make that argument by looking at my videos and maybe possibly to don't do that. Right, let's talk about some Espionage Act heroes and villains. Daniel Ellsberg. Good guy, I guess. I don't know, but uh, we'll talk about him in later videos about him releasing the Pentagon Papers and exposing the evil things that the government was doing during Vietnam. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, bad guys. They uh, stole the nuclear secrets. And uh, Julian Assange, WikiLeaks founder, to be determined. I'm not going to go into a bunch of the World War I battles. There it is. There's your trench warfare and the machine guns and the trenches. And it was a horrific war. And I mean, just looking at this picture, you can see these guys are wearing gas masks. It looks like a horror movie war. And that's what it was. It was a terrible war that the world was not ready for with, uh, with advanced weaponry. We were not suited to fight. And we were fighting it in an older way. Uh, disfigurement. Just a... a this is where you get shell shock for the first time, which we now refer to as post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, actually, the shell shock would have existed. Shell shock existed during actually the Civil War, where we started using that terminology. Then they rename it after you're living in these trenches, after getting shot and bombed and living in squalor for years on end. It drove the men crazy and their post-traumatic stress or their shell shock, which we don't use that term anymore, it became called basket cases. Well, actually, I think the basket case also referred to their disfigurement. I would have to look that up, but 
the term basket case and how uh, terrible the men's lives have become uh, just it shows you how bad this war was. So we joined the war. We win the war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Treaty of Versailles. The Treaty of Versailles will be signed by us, England, France, and Italy. Those are the main players in this. They are the winners of the war. So when you win the war, you get to make the decision. So the treaty is the document that decides the peace. And at first, in theory, the idea was, well, let's just settle things as easy as possible and let's get back to business as usual. We probably really shouldn't blame everything on Germany. We're all kind of guilty here. But we, even if Germany is guilty, it's not going to help anyone by putting all the blame on them. Well, England and France have been fighting this war for so long, and they had to deal with a lot of the casualties. They were clearly upset, and they refused to not blame Germany. They had to blame Germany. It wasn't just blaming Germany. There were punishments. It wasn't just, this is all your fault. It's, this is all your fault, and you're going to pay for it. And so they were severely punished. Some examples was all their military was pretty much taken away. They were not allowed to build up a military. That's part of the Treaty of Versailles. So it's very punitive, draconian, and it's going to lead to World War II. Uh, so their their military is limited, and they're forced to pay reparations to these other countries. Oh, well, we suffered a lot because of you, Germany, so you're going to pay us for that. And that's going to pretty much destroy the German economy. And, uh, you know, that's going to cause even bigger problems. So thanks, Woodrow Wilson. Way to stick to that 14-point plan. Now, one of the bigger points in this 14-point plan and one of the bigger points for U.S. history is Article X of the Treaty of Versailles. No, this is not an X-Men character. Article X is Article 10 of the treaty. So we go to Part 10 of the treaty and we find this section that says, if a nation is threatened, other league members must come to their defense. League of Nations. So, you know, if Batman gets attacked and Superman, and Green Lantern, they're all going to jump in and, and save him. That's the way it works. It's a team. It's a super group. Now, if you look at this map, you'll see that the blue colored countries are part of the League of Nations. The, the, the lighter blue here are kind of like a quasi member and the gray are not members. The gray are not members of the League of Nations. Wait a second. Didn't Woodrow Wilson create the League of Nations? Isn't he the president of the United States? It sure looks like we didn't join. Yeah, because there's a problem. The U.S. Constitution says that the legislative branch, they have the power to declare war, not the League of Nations. The League of Nations, Article X, will say that if another country goes to war, then we have to go to war. That violates the Constitution because the Constitution says that we go to war when the legislative branch says we go to war, not when the League of Nations goes to war. Problem number two. So this violates the legislative branch. And guess what? The legislative branch in form of the Senate has the power to approve treaties. So they can easily say, hey, that violates the Constitution. We're just not going to approve it. Even if it does in the war, we're not going to approve it. So if, if someone gets attacked, then under this Article 10, then we have to go. We have to go to all these wars. If someone attacks Australia, we don't even think about it. It's off to Australia. If someone attacks India, it's off to India. Maybe the Congress, which is elected by the American people, should decide. Maybe the American people should decide if the American people should fight a war, not this League of Nations. And so Congress states, hey, that's our power. That's our written power, enumerated power in the Constitution. We're not going to forfeit it, and we can't forfeit it. We're not allowed to. We cannot violate the Constitution with this treaty. So we are not going to approve this treaty. And so we deny the Treaty of Versailles, and we do not join the League of Nations because it goes against our checks and balances enumerated in the declare or in the sorry constitution there it is declare war that is one of our powers one of our checks on the executive branch that is an legislative check on the president Woodrow Wilson we don't want to be world police we do not want to fight wars all around the country we just got into a terrible war we just suffered thousands of deaths we don't want to do it again and we don't want to do it in every single country for every single reason so guess what we are not going to sign the treaty of versailles and we're going to stay out of the league of nations you jokers can defend each other we're not getting involved and when the most powerful country in the world does not get involved then the league of nations is pretty much meaningless it's dead on arrival I could defend or criticize the role of the government. You, you, can, you can rationally defend the government taking a strong role in the economy in order to win the war. As long as the government agrees to give back that authority, which they often don't do. But you, it's hard to defend them suspending the rights, especially the freedom of speech, 
for the, the winning of the war. That's going a little too far. But Sedition Act is still on the books. And those are the, the, not the Sedition, the Espionage Act is still on the books. And then you can defend our decision not to sign the Treaty of Versailles, or you can criticize it saying, well, if we would have signed the Treaty of Versailles, then maybe we would have been able to prevent World War II. Probably not. 